So I understand there's a time for question and answers. As I said, I'm not an engineer, so technical questions I'm not very good to answer, but other questions I might, one hand there, at least give my opinion, if not a correct answer. Yeah, thanks a lot for your great insights on this, um, yeah, based on your experience of many years in this uh, sector. And it's very interesting to compare it uh, with uh, our research and to understand it. I've got one observation and one more question to elaborate on one point much more. One observation is more, I think, for, for our community. Um, I think you've spoken in terms of evolution and revolution, which makes uh, a lot of sense, but which also suggests a sort of dichotomy between two things and two boxes. I think our tasks as researchers will be uh, sort of to work that out as a continuum uh, and to find concepts which sort of can map the level of, of revolution uh, within a particular system. Uh, so, so that's more sort of an observation for ourselves. Um, a second is, is a question to you. Uh, so you've uh, looked to the future and you've especially worked out uh, the autonomous vehicle as a revolution and uh, the electrification of the vehicle as an evolution. You've said a little bit less about the evolution towards more uh, shared ownership. So I was going to ask you, could you elaborate a little bit more? You've identified it as an evolution. Um, in one of the last, or in the last session, we also mm -hmm. uh, uh, heard papers who studied the recent moves of Renault and other firms also in Paris in uh, entering the car sharing market. Uh, and um, well, in a simple way, you could say either um, car manufacturers could sort of uh, come into this uh, service industry and uh, or there may be other big players emerging uh, but in both ways uh, I can I can imagine that that, that 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 does have significant implications for car manufacturers uh, still you've identified it as, a, as an evolution could you say uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on why you think these changes will not uh, you, you don't expect them to to uh, to move too quickly? Okay. Uh, yes, I think uh, car sharing, be it uh, ownership sharing or just sharing the use, is a very significant evolution. I think it is a necessary evolution because uh, many of the problems of city and congestion. I mean, congestion clearly should lead and will lead to a development in car sharing, be it through shared ownership or uh, shared use. So, yes, I believe this will happen over time. It will mean a reduction in the use in the sales of new cars, because we will need less cars. And I think this reduction in the level of ownership of individual car is required for environmental and urban reasons in the years to come. So I recognize this as a major evolution. It has been slower than anticipated, which we have already seen. I mean, even in the US, where there are a number of significant privileges for car sharing, uh, the growth has not been as fast as anticipated. <coughs> So I believe this will happen on a continuous basis, and I think this is a good thing. Now, what are the limits, and what should the OEMs do? The limits are, as I said, the rational car user should like to develop this. The passionate, considering the car as his castle, uh, is less intent on doing this. And specifically, I mean, he is intent on ownership. And uh, ownership, of course, being a long-term leasing is not legally ownership, but de facto, for it's not different from ownership for the person who has a long-term lease. Okay, so I think movement will happen, it will not be boom, 
very fast. And to address, uh, and you see that car manufacturers, yes, should play a role. And they do play a role. I mean, they are able, they own fleets of cars, they finance fleets of cars, as you have seen in Paris maybe, as there was the Autolib system, which was a system managed by the city. Now the city has said to Renault and other OEMs that provide the car, provide the service, we just provide the space on the infrastructure. <coughs> and uh, Renault and TSA have followed this path. And they have the financial resources to do so. I mean, it's, it's not a major issue. And it's, it's not technically difficult. So I think this will happen. It is not a major challenge. The impact, as I said, will be a reduction in the sale of new cars. And maybe a more rapidly growing trend towards a rational buyer or the rational user of the, of the car. Because uh, one mentioned uh, Dacia Logan, but my idea at the time was that given the circumstances of the world, uh, the rational buyer would play a more important role in the future. And the shared ownership or use is an element of this increased rationality of the car user. Of course, uh, the major difference which I mentioned and which is a problem for the car industry is that the driver of a plane, the pilot, is always a trained professional knowing the airplane he flies perfectly well. The driver of a car is an amateur. He may be a good or a bad driver, depends. Uh, and he does not know perfectly the car he is driving. If you made a test, I made it quite often uh, uh, when I was uh, in an OEM, uh, to ask any driver how he knows to adjust the heating. Tragic. And one tries to make it simple to understand, but they simply don't know how to use it. Uh, most of the drivers don't use uh, half or two-thirds of the function of their vehicle. Now, coming back to your issue, uh, the difference between the car and a plane is that, oh, well, you also have it in planes, uh, people do drive cars for the pleasure of it. And I believe nobody will be able to forbid anybody to drive a car for the pleasure of it. Uh, you still uh, have people riding horses or driving carts. And uh, so these will continue to be. But let's say if you do, uh, you, you go daily to your work and back and spend half an hour in traffic jams, I don't see much pleasure there. And I think most people, and you know, for a large part of my life, I was privileged enough uh, to have a car, not with an autonomous car, but with a driver, enabling me to do whatever I wanted in this car. And it was an enormous privilege, and I enjoyed it. 
I love to drive on weekends or on a circuit and so forth. So I don't think it's, it's an issue, uh, you know, to, that uh, you do not control the car. If you want to drive a car, you will always be able to drive a car. But many uses of the car are not only dangerous, but pleasureless. And these should be completely automated. As I said, there's a very difficult issue, which is giving control to the car, taking it back to the human, giving it back to the car. And that is very, very difficult. And even airline pilots uh, find it difficult. There was an accident in Air France, which is not the Boeing recent accident, where clearly the issue was that the pilots taking over from the automatic pilot caused the accident. And uh, I remember other cases uh, where this situation causes major, major problems. That is why I believe that the so-called level three is completely unrealistic. It does exist on the road. I mean, you have cars which are at the three level, and I believe they are dangerous for themselves and others. Yeah. Yes? My name is Sigfrido Ramirez, Max Planck Institute for European Legal History in Frankfurt. And I would like to follow what you said. You are not a technician, but more somebody who has a background in public policy. So that's an issue you have not uh, taken directly in your speech. So what's the role of uh, public policies apart from regulation? As you know, there is a, an important debate at European level. You just mentioned the initiative on European initiative on batteries, uh, encouraged by the European Commission, but there are other uh, policy documents that recently have been uh, published, uh, issued by the Commission on what the strategy for the future of the sector. Um, so what, what you think, for example, one of the key issues now is the question of whether this is needed to have European champions, industrial policy. This is a new old debate. I mean, I think you have been involved in that debate many years ago, but now it's coming back on the table. So what's your opinion in this evolution? What would be, or in, I mean, this uh, with revolutionary uh, intention, what would be uh, the role of policy? Because at the European level, but also maybe elsewhere, because the, the impression we have is that there are uh, some countries like China who have no doubts on what uh, to do. But what, uh, what would be your, your take on this? Okay. Uh, clearly, uh, governments or EU authorities have a major role to play in the evolution of infrastructure, rules, and regulation. And I understand this is not the issue you want to be addressed, but if they did address it effectively, that would already be good, because it's not the case today. So, putting this aside, this to-do aside, and a very important to do, which in my view, as I said, is not well addressed. For example, the issue of experimentation is better addressed in the United States than in Europe, and it's a regulation issue. So I put this aside, and I come back to the issue you mentioned, which is an issue of industrial policy, if I understand well. Uh, one has to recognize uh, that a government controlling its country uh, is an efficient actor of uh, economic development, and one sees it in China very well. If one looks back, no car manufacturer was ever born in an open economy. Uh, at the time European manufacturers were born, each country was protected by all kinds of barriers. Uh, the last European car manufacturer to appear was Volkswagen in the 1930s, and it was a very closed economy. 
uh, American manufacturers appeared in a very closed economy, which was the economy of the state at the time, very well protected. Then manufacturers appeared in Japan, which was a completely closed economy, and then in Korea. Uh, then nothing happened, no births for about 30 years, till China appeared. And China is now developing manufacturers with rules which are barriers. You cannot have foreign ownership of a company within China manufacturing cars because the length of time to develop the know-how is such that if you have no protection, you will not grow. Okay, do I believe we can go back in Europe uh, to a protected or closed economy to encourage our manufacturers to develop themselves? I would not bet even money on it. Uh, do I believe that the larger the manufacturer, the more efficient he is? I'm not absolutely certain. I mean, if you look at history, for many years, the largest manufacturer was by far General Motors. And you see that the costs of being too large, trying to integrate the different brands, which for many years were quite independent, caused a crash of General Motors because the ability to create, innovate, be efficient on a small scale, simply did not exist. So I'm not certain that the concept of European champion is in the automotive industry, as in other industries, much more rational than the concept of national champion. I mean, at one time, at one point in time, everybody in France was explaining that yes, one should have a national champion, Renault plus PSA. And I thought it was damn stupid. Uh, Italy has coalesced all its manufacturers in one national champion, and this champion clearly cannot meet competition. Uh, Germany has three major players. They are competing and they are dominating the luxury market in the world. So I'm not a great believer in a national champion when there is not a wish from the companies to merge and work together. Now, I believe that in some cases, I mentioned the battery project, uh, I think uh, this is positive and it requires, because it is a common technology. I mean, I mean, I don't believe any manufacturer will say uh, and want or believe that he has a lasting advantage in his batteries. And no manufacturer has a volume to build on this lasting advantage. So there, I think, a common privately owned, I mean, owned by the manufacturers or whomever. I mean, this is, has to be debated. This is a good idea. I believe that in a, field, a specific field of regulation, EU has a role to play. I'll take one example, and it's uh, CO2 efficiency. I'm all in favor of a carbon tax. I believe it's a very good idea. I mean, there are social conditions to it, etc. And uh, of course, you cannot have a carbon tax for European industries alone because otherwise you will import carbon in products because your industries will be less competitive. But if you try to air the idea of a carbon tax to the first industrial country in Europe, which is Germany, they say never. Why they say never? Because if you had a barrier of entry based on carbon content, 
you would make uh, the U.S. government unhappy. If you made the U.S. government unhappy, uh, if the German government will be most unhappy because it means that the exports of cars to the U.S. will be very much more difficult. I happen to be uh, yesterday and the day before in Hungary. And uh, an official, a major official of this country explained, look, uh, three-fourths of our industry is automotive. It's 100% export. Directly to Germany, massively, and indirectly to the state. Our government is popular because we have a growth rate of 45% per year. A wage increase in real terms at the same level. We have no unemployment. If America puts a 25% surtax on German cars, the political stability of our country is at risk. So it's, I can't see a, a protective policy happening. And the be world being what it is, I mean, one can speak of the recent events at Renault, but uh, I will not speak about this. But let's say one recognizes that in the present global economy, the ability of a government to act on a company is limited and is not always efficient. I have not fully answered your question, but I have tried to give an elements of answer to your question. Uh, during your presentation, you have insisted on the fact that it is necessary for car makers to cooperate together or to cooperate with tier one or tier two suppliers. May I ask you what is your opinion about the recent episode between Renault on one side and FCA on the other side? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, I, I will not comment, as I just said, on recent events concerning Renault. Um, I would like to ask you a question about f the role of finance in all this process, because uh, you talk about startup, which is a very useful kind of organization to promote innovation. But when you have startup that get the size of Tesla or Uber, and have revenues of several billion dollars, and they're still evaluated as startup, which means that even if they lose and keep losing money on every year <coughs> and every month, they are evaluated nine, ten times more uh, mm -hmm. than the actual value they produce. And these are companies which are, and if you look at all the mobility actors that are putting uh, scooter, electric scooters in, in the cities and, 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 and other kind of new transport, car sharing, and whatever. Basically, nobody's making money, which is r reasonable because this is an exploratory phase to create new business. But still, when these companies are evaluated so much and they have such a power to invest and create the vision of the future that you were talking about, it's difficult for car makers, which has, are, are evaluated with ratio that are seven or six times lower, uh, to be able to fit. I mean, these are two words that they are supposed to cooperate together, but they function with completely different rules because of finance. So can you have a view on that, please? Well, uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, uh, and you elaborated on a problem which is a very real problem and which I addressed uh, shortly in my speech. Uh, some of these startups are not uh, da dangerous for car manufacturers. I mean, it's Uber uh, for me is, is not an issue. Uh, Google, I don't know what their long-term strategy is. Will they want to be a car manufacturer? Or will they want to be uh, the worldwide tier one supplier of autonomy to all car manufacturers in the world? which was the theory of Microsoft 
vis-à-vis uh, 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 computer industry. So I don't know what their strategy will be. And we just have to build scenarios and try to understand how it happens. As I mentioned, the fact that as integrators, our know-how is less important in the future than it was is for me a, a major problem, and I have no answer to, to this one. Now, uh, you mentioned the role of customers. Uh, the experience of all car manufacturers is that we are very good at predicting uh, customer reaction to small evolutions. We are absolutely bad at predicting reactions of customers to major evolutions. And I, I will take two examples from Renault. Uh, we developed the first small minivan, the Scenic. Our marketing expert uh, told us not more than 300 per day. Uh, customers had us build 1,800 a day, and the prediction held until the day the customers went to the store. You mentioned Dacia. Uh, one month before launch, our marketing expert uh, told us uh, production should be limited at 80,000 cars per year. We are now uh, slightly over a million. And because in both cases, they had no references. I mean, uh, a good marketer looks at trends and uh, makes tests, uh, either quantitative or qualitative, group tests and so forth. But people see the present. They do not see the future which means that, for example, in the, our autonomous car issue, nobody has the slightest idea of how many people will buy the damn thing. I mean, and nobody can make a reasonable prediction. And you can have, if there are, let's say, four accidents, even caused by the customer, not by the car, uh, it would mean a drop. And I spoke of this uh, speed, uh, cruise control accidents we had. We explained everything, etc. But I don't have a single friend who uses now his cruise control. They don't trust the thing anymore. And this happened 14 years ago. It was not a technical problem. Cruise control was perfect. But 14 years afterwards, it's still there. So the customer, of course, is king, but he is a very unpredictable king. 